All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's event, Strengthening Democracy Through Civil Dialogues, MLK Jr. Strength to Love in a Time of Crisis. My name is Chelsea Chang, and I'm a second year Master's of Public Affairs student at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. I'm also proud to sit on the school's DEI committee, which will be comprised, comprised of nine students, staff, and faculty to champion LBJ's commitment to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion as part of our mission in the community. It is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to the current and 12th Dean of the LBJ School, Dean J.R. DeShazo. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Chelsea, um, and, and welcome to you all. I'm J.R. DeShazo, Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And thank you for attending the inaugural event of the Office of Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, also affectionately known as JEDI. Um, today, we're here to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who serves as an exemplar for our first Strengthening Democracy Dialogue. Uh, Dr. King's political friendship with President Lyndon Johnson ensured the passage of the Watershed 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. More broadly, the 60s and 70s um, represented a period where Congress passed legislation designed to address racial and economic inequality. Policies sought to prohibit or eliminate discrimination in the workplace, access to education, healthcare, housing, environment, and lots of other public services. Now, this, this, this week of remembrance is an occasion for us all to reflect on how successful these policies have actually been in addressing that goal. Some will point to these very policies in order to say that institutional discrimination no longer occurs that equality of opportunity has been established. Others, when reflecting on our progress towards racial equality, will say we need only look at the evidence to see that we are far from achieving that goal. I say that we need a civil dialogue about this question of progress towards racial equality. And that dialogue would benefit from addressing several important questions that we, as students of public policy, need to become prepared to address and, and facilitate. First, how do we measure the disparate impacts of our policies that might arise from current or historic racial discrimination? And can we discuss what counts as evidence of, of racial inequality? Number two, when we find disparate impacts, can we trace them back to either existing policies or a legacy of racism? And if so, can we discuss what causes of what what causes and and the, the persistence of these impacts over time? And three, can we design new and more effective policies to address these disparate impacts? Can we discuss how we measure progress towards racial equality and whether these policies are actually working or not, and what needs to be developed more in the future? These are just questions I think every student of public policy, including myself and our broader community should be grappling with. And I think Dr. King would look at um, the current state of affairs and agree that for us in the, in the policy sphere, these are challenges that we should be prepared to lead public conversations around. Um, I'm very um, excited to have um, today's conversation, strengthening democracy through civil dialogues as, a, as the very first JEDI event. I wanna thank Dr. Thompson for her participation as our guest. And I wanna recognize the leadership of Dr. Peniel Joseph as the Associate Dean uh, for JEDI and Director Estefan Delgado uh, for his leadership in this space. Um, Chelsea, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean DeShazo. Now I have the honor of introducing you to our featured panelists for today's dialogue. Dr. Lisa B. Thompson is an award-winning playwright scholar. She is the Bobby and Sherry Patton Professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and the College of Liberal Arts Advisor to the Dean for Faculty Mentoring and Support at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Peniel Joseph is a Joint Professor of Public Affairs and the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and in the School of Liberal Arts. Dr. Joseph is the founding director for the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and is the inaugural associate dean for the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Esteban Daniel Delgado 
is the inaugural Justice Director of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Delgado currently sits on the leadership committee for the Aula y Vota Action Fund and the Todos Juntos Learning Center Board of Directors and the Executive Committee for the Association of Rice Alumni Board of Directors. Thank you for attending today's conversation. I will now pass things over to Dr. Joseph to get our MLK dialogue with Dr. Thompson started. Oh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Chelsea. Um, really, really very, very excited for this to be our inaugural um, event. And I want to thank again, uh, Dr. Thompson, my friend and colleague, who I'm very much inspired and, and awed by, um, and, and Director Delgado, Esteban Delgado, who's been in this space uh, both as a student, but as a leader, uh, and continues to be an amplifier in this space. Um, my first uh, laying out of why this event, you know, the strength to love in a time of crisis, is that when we think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 2022, one, we shouldn't think of it as just one day or one week. We should be striving um, to think about what Dr. King talked about with a beloved community and a revolution of values every day, every day, day in and day out. Obviously, Dr. King, like all of us, was human and had his own flaws and his imperfections, but he called us towards this aspirational America and aspirational global community. And I think in this time of 2022, this is going to be, we're entering the second year uh, of the pandemic. Uh, this is two years after, um, this spring will be two years after the, 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 the unfortunate and tragic, tragic murder of, of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, and the racial and political reckoning that we saw all across the United States, but globally in 2020, I think it's so important for us as an LBJ community and also on the 40 acres, University of Texas at Austin, to really be thinking about these issues in the context of justice, equity, diversity and inclusion, but also research and policy. Now, where does love come in? <laughs> uh, I think that what Dr. King tried to model is this idea that uh, justice was what love looked like in public. Uh, in Strength to Love, which is Dr. King's favorite book, and we have a copy right here, uh, Dr. King talked about love in action, right? And love, love is action and love in action. And so what I wanted to do today with these two really brilliant interlocutors is really talk about what we're doing uh, day to day in our own work uh, to try to, put love in action and to have the strength to love in the time of crisis, but in a way that doesn't separate Dr. King's call for a revolution of values from public policy and from history, from these hard conversations. Uh, one, one um, before opening it up, one, one quote I wanna read from Dr. King, and this is Dr. King's last uh, Sunday speech. Um, and this is the, this is the passion, passion Sunday sermon at the National Cathedral uh, on March 31st, 1968. And this is, a, this is a sermon entitled, Remaining Awake Through, um, Through a Great Revolution. Uh, Dr. King says, ultimately, a great nation is a compassionate nation. America has not met its obligations and its responsibilities uh, to the poor. Um, but Dr. King is also hopeful. He says, uh, let me close by saying that we have difficult days ahead in the struggle for justice and peace, but I will not yield to a politic of despair, right? I say to you that our goal is freedom, and I believe we're going to get there because however much she strays from it, the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned, though we may be as a people, our destiny is tied up in the destiny of America. Um, this is really extraordinary and extraordinarily um, realistic, but also optimistic rhetoric. So I want us to really think about what do we do in this current time? We're, in, we're, we're living in a time of, of voter suppression. We're living in a time of racial and economic segregation. We're living in a time of political censorship when we think about assaults on teaching this history, assaults on so-called critical race theory. We're living in a time of hyperpolarization, And yet we're at a policy school that uh, would not be around if not for really the, the, the legacy of President Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Lyndon Baines Johnson's legacy is inextricably tied up to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
because they worked in creative tension with each other to really produce some of the most important uh, public policy uh, victories in American history. And really when we think about the Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, that is the national consensus from 1965 to 2013 that provides us with the context for Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, that provides us with the context for, for um, the opportunities that we have, uh, people who are people of color, um, women, uh, immigrants, um, trans. It's the Johnson Society's dream of a great society, right? However flawed, however imperfect, that leads to the social movements and the, 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 the policy uh, interventions, or at least works with those social movements and the policy interventions that led us to a more equitable society. So what can we do in 2022 to talk about both sides of this, the research, the policy side, but yes, also the side where Dr. King says America should be a compassionate na a nation, where Dr. King talks to us about a revolution of values and how can we live that revolution of values uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so I'm gonna open this up and it's, this is gonna be a conversation with, with me and um, Dr. Thompson, who I'm gonna refer to as Lisa because she's a friend. So I respect Dr. Thompson, <laughs> but I'm gonna call her Lisa. She can call me Peniel. Um, and Director Delgado, um, um, I wanna have that conversation. And what are we doing? One thing I'll note is that uh, uh, Dr. Thompson has uh, written three books, uh, Beyond the Black Lady, Sexuality and the New African-American Middle Class, Single Black Female, and Underground Monroe and the Mamalogs, Three Plays, which is one of my favorites. I, I have that, I read that, I saw uh, one of them too. Uh, and so that's one of my favorites. I felt like I was a part of that. Uh, and and, and uh, Dr. Thompson, Lisa has one of the best voices um, and, and ears for Black dialogue that you would ever, um, somebody who grew up in the Black community in, in Jamaica, Queens, uh, and I can hear the Black people. Her, her, her dialogue as a playwright is not constructed. It's actually how we, how we speak and how we feel and what we do. So it's really an honor to, to oh, be in dialogue with you. So Dr. Thompson, my, my, my question is, what can we do, this strength to love? Because your, your plays and your, what you're doing with Black Austin Matters is all about loving Black folks, loving Black folks as three-dimensional human beings. But also I think it's about showing that by loving Black folks, we help and enhance the entire society. You know, we help people who are, who are trans, who are queer, who are white, who are Asian, who are Latinx, how, how it's, it's the key. So I, I want us to talk about that. Well, but I'm glad you um, brought in the, cause I, you know, I'm an artist scholar and I'm honored to be here in conversation with one of my heroes. Uh, we, we met years ago at, at, at Harvard, um, at, at, some, at, the du Bois, at, at Skip's house at the Du Bois Institute and um, was really struck by, uh, inspired by you. So I continue to be, so thank you for inviting me to be part of this today. And for me, um, I really turned to art um, as my way of thinking about um, both politics and love. It's a way to show love and it is about, thank you for your comments about um, the, my plays because they really are um, love letters to um, my community and my community is vast and complex. And, and I think that the range of the work shows that. But for me, I wanted to kind of lean, I, I listened to a lot of King this weekend, a lot of his speeches, but I also, you know, kept coming back to thinking about you know, people that we've lost, um, Bell Hooks and August Wilson. So I'm thinking about this idea of like, where are we right now? And so I think the more we put art at the forefront, it would be helpful. Um, what August Wilson said was all art is political in the sense that it serves someone's politics. Um, I think that's really poignant and true. And that Bell Hooks said the function of art is to do more than tell it like it is. It is to imagine what is possible. And I think that my work reflects back, backwards in history, but also you know, projects forward and asks us what we want to do. Um, so the, the, the hard question you're asking is, you know, what are we doing now in 2022? I can't believe we're here, but I wanna make sure we think about King as well. And I want to share my own remembrance of King I was a babe, you know, basically a toddler, but I remember the day he was assassinated and because the first time I saw my parents crying and I was 
you know, three years old and trying to figure out what was going on in which my older brother who, you know, all of, you know, seven, I think was like, you know, I got this, I'll explain to you. He, he said their, their, their father died, which was very interesting. You know, that was his way of interpreting what was going on. And, um, but I think that we're soon be a place, we'll be at a time when people that were alive when he was alive will not be around. So I, I'm thinking now I'm just seeing your place, but I want people to stop. To, I love the fact you talked about his, him being complex and um, not just someone who is perfect, but that, that we are moving toward a certain kind of sense of humanity that is complex. And in that complexity, find a way for us to, because what's at, what's at stake right now is the whole entire country. So for us not to implode and to, think, and to move with, with love, but also understand people are imperfect, whether they're leaders or or, or adversaries in some ways. And, and so I wanted to just begin with that, this idea of you know, love and art and how we use art to kind of look at people's flaws because the most interesting characters are the ones that are complex and three-dimensional and troubled and um, having an arc of change. And we're in the arc of a drama right now in our country. So I hope that... That, uh, that's, that's great. And that's that we're just getting started. We're just getting started. So um, I'm going to ask the same thing to um, Estevan, Director Delgado. When you think about this idea of strength to love in a time of crisis, how can we actionize that in ways that impact, um, impact you know, our students, the, the world? Because I don't want to I don't want to silo it to LBJ and UT right now, because I'm going to ask that later. But how can we just in our day to day? And, and are, do you feel you're trying to do that? And, it, and, and if so, in what way? Definitely. Well, I think Dr. King, you know, brings up a really interesting metaphor when trying to kind of talk about this idea, you know, the idea of kind of like a knock at midnight, you know, this, this idea that there's a really big urgency around being able to kind of love your neighbor and being able to kind of talk about, you know, what's at, truly at stake, you know, democracy and freedom is at stake. And if we can't, you know, find, you know, the love and compassion to really kind of reach out, you know, then, you know, um, you know, I think, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, bulletin of atomic scientists really kind of have it right in, in, in a sense, you know, uh, we're, we're only, you know, only, only a couple minutes to midnight in a sense. Um, and so I know it's kind of a, a grim metaphor, but I think, you know, when we took, put it in a show, social con context, you know, I think that's really where we're at. I think what, what's really interesting uh, when we think about it from a, a social context as well is that we live in a time of existential turmoil, right? Uh, in today's age, we have, you know, the media cycle that kind of um, makes us feel that we're also in the sense of urgency that if we don't shame, if we don't, um, you know, um, go to war with the, the person that, that, that doesn't see eye to eye with us in that exact moment and try to change their heart and mind right then and there, um, that things are gonna also fall apart in the moment. And I think, um, one of the things that I also, um, you know, learned from you in kind of preparing for this was this like, kind of idea of, um, you know, this, this idea of maybe kind of uh, moral imagination and, and delayed gratification as well. And, and what's really possible if we, if we say, hey, um, using the kind of stance of, uh, of nonviolence, but kind of also peace, and what does it mean to not label and not judge and, and really kind of give those that don't agree with us an on ramp, um, you know, to make uh, really good um, uh, connections right? Because that's what love is all about. Love is making connections with those, you know, that uh, maybe don't agree with us, but that can allow us to build these bridges for long-term connections that, that we can really start to, to tackle some of these long-term problems that, um, that still, you know, plague society today that, that Dr. King was, you know, paving the foundation for, you know, back in the sixties. And, and I think it's the, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the, it's the same struggle, but, you know, at a different time. And um, it, it's, uh, I think we can use the, some, most of the same playbook and, um, you know, really excited to kind of think about how we can, how we can use those same ideas from, from his leadership to move us forward. Yeah. And I want to thank you. Thank you, Esteban. I want to uh, talk to you and Lisa today about um, some of the problems that King diagnosed, but what are their evolutions in our time? Because I think 
one of the things that I've always been, uh, I've been privileged to study and write about Dr. King and continue to do so, uh, so it's part of my, my lifelong research project, um, is the way in which King uh, spoke so courageously over time about even the ugly aspects of American history and American politics. Um, and he was able to do that, but still keep love in mind, but he becomes a very controversial figure. And it's important for all of us who are um, students of Dr. King to understand how deeply uh, Dr. King became unliked when we think about the last several years of his life. And he still was this huge proponent of peace and nonviolence, but people didn't like the critique of America that Dr. King articulated. And so I want us to talk about that. And, and Lisa, you know, Dr. King talked about poverty. Um, he talked about racism and white supremacy. Um, you know, some people would criti criticize him now and say, well, he was a critical race theorist. He's one of the founders of critical race theory. Uh, and all CRT really is, is just a, a, a theory uh, that tries to um, look at the way in which race has impacted the making and shaping of law uh, in the United States historically. That's all it is. Um, so it's not indoctrination. It's not, it's not anything but that. Um, you know, you know, why do you think Dr. King was so controversial for speaking out against war and violence and trying to connect war, violence, racism, inequality um, to uh, just this idea of injustice. Why, why was that so controversial then? And why does in certain ways that remains controversial in the United States? You know, why does talking about inequality and the way in which race, and I would add race, class, gender, sexuality, gender identification, body identification. So I would add that because I think what Black Lives Matter has done um, um, by the way, I will add this, led by Black feminists and Black women activists. Um, so there's, yeah. there's, 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 uh, there's cis men and other you know, people in solidarity, but certainly they've, they've been leaders, um, has really amplified our notion of what humanity means and what humanity is. So we, we talk about LG, LGBTQIA+, uh, we talk about um, uh, Black lesbian feminists, we talk about poor folks. We talk about people who are cash poor, people who are disabled. Um, you know, we, we talk about that in ways where instead of excluding them from our family, our family within the Black community now, we're saying we're going to center them, right? And so what can we do? And I think that's what you're trying to do with Black Austin Matters is center that conversation. What, one, what, why, why is that still so threatening to people, you know? And why don't we remember that King was facing such an uphill battle to tell, and remember King, I wanna to stress to everyone that King profoundly loves America and he believes in American democracy, but he loves it, the nation enough to criticize segregation and contradictions and hypocrisy in ways that make him very unpopular. It's really startling to say that he becomes at his most unpopular when he says we should not be going to war in Vietnam. And really we think about the, the, the war in Vietnam, it, it, there were some atrocities committed, not just in my lie, mm -hmm. but, but you know, you know and, and those atrocities reverberate. There's black soldiers on the front lines disproportionate to their demographics, right? And he says black and white soldiers can kill overseas, but they can't live on the same block yes. in Detroit. So, so I want you to talk about that. Like what, you know, but King is still talking about love. What's so interesting, he's a preacher, he's a pastor, he's this faith leader. He never, but he's also this person who's interested in policy, right? And he's interested in politics. I mean, many would argue that that's the real job of those that are in these positions, right? Those, you know, those of us who are in education, those of us who are in, in, in um, faith leadership, that our job is to think about the global, because it's not just um, a... a um, position that is something you're just doing for, for the check. You're doing it because it's, uh, it is an act of love in many ways. So, and I, and I again, going back to this idea of him being evacuated from all of his speeches and then listening to them yesterday, you know, so many, like I think it was in the 12, um, 
that he, that he's been completely evacuated to just a short portion of I had a, a dream. And it's just um, a real disservice. And that's what we're kind of pushing against as we, as we see the basically making what we do for a living illegal in our state if we were teaching for younger people. Um, it's really, really frightening. So this idea that um, the king is being completely in many ways despised for calling out and making people uncomfortable. And I think that that's in many ways for me after the election of some years ago of a certain person, I began doing more of that conversation with, with, with my um, white friends and allies and really speaking out things that make people uncomfort more uncomfortable because it is, but, but the thing about what's, what's so scary is that it's just the truth. Did you notice that our, my, you know, my child is the only black child in the class and we're supposed to be friends and you even thought what it means for your child to go through K through sixth grade, never being in a room with anybody black besides my son, which means you've never been in the classroom with a black girl. Um, those kind of things that King was saying was not outrageous. But if you see the world, if things are fine the way they are, and someone reminds you, um, and even for people who are uh, people of color who are affluent, and you start talking about, well, some, to getting getting a vaccination may put you on your on your feet off your feet for three days and if you have a kind of job where being missing work for three days make mean something in terms of you being able to eat and then we have to we're uncomfortable all of a sudden like oh my goodness people are seeing that so I think that's part of it but I do believe that his um, desire to push us to think about love right um, Bill Hook said love is a commitment a combination of care commitment knowledge responsibility respect and trust and that's what we're kind of pushing us to do if we're going to stay together cohesively as a country. And it, uh, this is the first, probably the first time I've really been afraid about the possibility of that, uh, mm -hmm. this great experiment um, not of failing. Uh, it means all those things. So we have to kind of figure out how to, how to, what commitment and care and responsibility means. It's not just speaking nice to each other, um, despite our differences. It's thinking about responsibility for both sides of any kind of argument. And there are many, sometimes it's more than more than two sides. But I do want us to acknowledge the fact that we are a complex, um, being the black community, a complex group. And, and you're right, in Black Austin Matters, it's important for us not to just highlight the special Negroes um, that we want to see. To me, the beautiful campus of black life is you know, cross sexuality, class, faith, and um, gender, genders. And, and that's important to me and my uh, co host, our brainchild with me, um, Richard, Richard, Richard Reddick. That we want to show what blackness means to us in Austin, especially with all this national press about Austin being this hot city that everyone's moving to, and it's the only one um, fast growing city that is losing its black population at the same time. And we want to say, well, okay, we've heard that over and over again. Who's this black community we're talking about exactly? And that's one of the th ways I'm trying to show that is really a love letter for me to um, a place that's embraced me and my child uh, and my family here moving to Austin and thinking about what it means to be part of the reverse migration of black folks to another part, to, to back to the South and reclaiming this space. So that's a big answer. No, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'd love to add to that because I think yes. it's also really interesting. You know, this is, um, you know, Strength to Love is, is the first real text of, of MLK that I've, you know, really dug into. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've heard his, his speeches and I've been able to, um, you know, watched a lot of documentaries over you know the past couple of years, but it was really interesting, you know, to, to read this. I think one of the things that really comes across is MLK really recognizes um, the globalization of Christianity, right, during this time, and I think and I think wants to make the connection from between the values of democracy and the injustices that are currently happening to Black Americans and appeal to the values of the white Christian church. And I think, and that is, it's almost kind of like that, that reach across the table to be like, um, you know, in a, in a really kind of big way that I think maybe might seem kind of more commonplace today, but I think is something that like Dr. King is kind of making very apparent and very big for maybe kind of the, for what it is apparent to me, maybe one of the, the first times that is kind of like truly happening in American culture. And so um, I don't know if, if, that, if that resonates at all uh, with either of you, but that was something that kind of hit me kind of hard. It's like, oh my gosh, I, I wonder if this is one of the first times that this is kind of really happening 
to a lot of people in society when they're kind of hit, picking up this book, right? And 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 um, at this time in in American culture. Yeah, no, I think I think that's spot on, Esteban. I think that um, one of the things that we see that King does, and I think this bleeds into another question uh, for you both, is uh, he really transforms um, the the narrative and the American origin story, the narrative of American democracy. So in a way, we think about a, a contemporary analog would be uh, Nicole Hannah Jones in the 1619 Project, right? But what King does, even in this uh, speech that I was uh, quoting from at the start of this, uh, you know, remaining awake in a time of a great revolution, is he talks about reconstruction. He talks about um, um, 40 acres and a mule, and the fact that Black people were promised this but did not get. Uh, what they were promised even after the reconstruction amendments. And in fact, there was this great big backlash, just racial backlash. Uh, and he contrasts that with um, uh, European immigrants getting access to millions of acres of land through the Homestead Act, right? And so King really tells us a different story um, about ourselves. And I think I think he, he does it with this love ethic. And I wanna, you know, Lisa, talk about this idea of love and nonviolence the love and nonviolence, King pushes away from this kind of moral equivalency where there are two sides and they're equally right. King says that the side of America that was pro-slavery, the side of America that was the Confederacy, the side of America that is the Klan and massive resistance, the Bull Connors in, in Birmingham, Alabama, the Sheriff Jim Clarks in Selma, he says explicitly, the George Wallaces, uh, the governor of Alabama. He says that they are wrong. They are on the wrong side of history, but he says even in Strength to Love, uh, they're on the wrong side of his interpretation of Christianity, right? right. And so I, I definitely wanna talk about that because I think we've kind of hit a wall as a nation where it's very, very fuzzy in terms of when people talk about both sides, because when people talk about you can have disagreements in a democracy, but they're supposed to be, you're supposed to be thinking about these issues in good faith and not bad faith, right? And that's why something like voting rights, there was a point where uh, we built a consensus around voting rights for almost uh, 50 years. Supreme Court uh, blew away that consensus in 2013 with the Shelby v. Holder decision, which continues to haunt states like Texas. Barbara Jordan, uh, uh, she co-sponsored the 1975 Voting Rights Act extension that allowed for Texas and Arizona and other states to be included and, and really um, expanded that bill for the rights of um, um, Spanish speaking voters uh, and other voters who, who, who um, were language minorities as well. Um, so what, what can we do in terms of King definitely said, look, I'm gonna love these segregationists, but he resisted them tooth and nail, right? What can we do in this context, especially since so many people rhetorically say they admire Dr. King, but then when we think about policy, uh, the policies they promote actually subvert uh, the meaning of Dr. King's message, right? So there used to be, again, even Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Richard Nixon, um, all supported the Voting Rights Act a a after it was law, right? Um, um, yet now we have, we're in another reality, a much, much different reality. Um, what can we do now um, to, I won't even say reach across the aisle, but to talk to people who disagree with us and how can we use what King talked about in terms of love obviously nonviolence um, in our current time of crisis. I think one is, is to approach um, those within our own community, because I think people, not just ways he's taught in schools, it's just, it's also the ways been passed down. It's just, again, the evacuated king without the bite, because in that speech, he talks about how you could love all these people, but not like them. Right, I love the person about you know that by my house. No, but like in these people that I'm, I'm, I am basically in opposition with around the moral high, the moral um, substance of what he believed was right, and what he's also saying we all know is right. 
and I think my feeling is this, is this, I would be more at ease if people stopped trying to talk to me crazy. It's like, just say that we wanna have all of, we don't want people who've been in prison to have rights because a lot of them are, look a certain way and we don't want them to vote because you know, just be, be, be more honest about it. We would have a better, and cleaner conversation. So in the way in which they embrace King, they embrace the evacuated King without looking at the teeth that were, the teeth that, they were, that was in all of his discourse. It was not, wasn't all just love in a way that was, um, that, that you don't have, that you have, that you escape culpability or you escape responsibility or that you get to do whatever you want. That I love you even when you're doing wrong and it, up to the point where you're bombing my, my house. Um, so I think that that's really important for us to, uh, those, and, and also to let folks know on the other side, oh, King was just all about love and letting, and, and the panels were the, were the real way forward. It was like, but King was very clear about um, what was acceptable and what was not acceptable and for them to, to, I guess to us to give people the complex king so that he's more useful. So the kind of scholarship that you've been doing is so important for our students because they think all they know about is this one speech and it's really uh, disheartening to think about that. So that's just my first offering about that. Thank you, thank you. Esteban. Definitely, you know, I think in terms of moving forward, I, I grapple with this, this question because I think there's definitely multiple layers, you know, that we could that we can go on. Um, you know, one of the things that I definitely kind of this makes me kind of think about is how do we kind of organize ourselves to kind of move forward and get the most traction with those that we need to work with, you know, those that that definitely don't um, maybe agree with us, and how can we have the most uh, 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 how can we be most effective in those. Um, and those journeys, uh, right, when we're kind of trying to lobby for uh, um, uh, for those uh, for those next kind of uh, trying to lobby for justice. And what I what I kind of what keeps on coming back to me is the um, is the telegraph that uh, MLK sent to uh, Cesar Chavez, right? When when he kind of reached out and said, you know, my uh, our struggles are one and the same, mm -hmm. you know. And I think so often we get siloed in our struggles, right? But being able to come to a place um, and, and kind of get around this kind of hierarchy, right? And that like, okay, like my this struggle is better than that struggle or, you know, or if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it alone or, um, you know, and, and trying to find a place where we can say, um, you know, truly, I think, you know, if we're gonna be truly effective, right? Um, you know, with, um, in terms of um, how we are gonna go up against that next uh, battle, right? We're seeing so much erosion to these things that have really benefited us long-term, right? I saw just this morning that, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court is going to rehear re arguments on uh, affirmative action case. Um, you know, that's gonna be at the court level, but you know, but there will be other things that we're gonna be able to go up against at the, at the legislative level. It's going to take, a big tent approach, very similar to the one that MLK um, fostered, you know, during his time uh, when when he uh, uh, was fostering that nonviolent approach. And so it's thinking about how can we, you know, reorganize ourselves very similar to that model of leadership uh, in today's age. And so it's really kind of thinking about, in, in my mind, um, you know, how do we in today's age, um, you know, collectively organize ourselves in that way. There, there are so many um, great organizing models that are that are coming out in today's in today's age. Um, you know, but I think I'm still looking for that one, um, you know, that 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 truly fosters that um, uh, that that collective um, big tent model. And I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm really hoping that we that we get there. Can I comment? Esteban, I love what you're saying so much. I'm just going trying to stay in my chair. Um, I really want that to happen as well. And I think what's necessary is intergenerationally as well as across you know, our different identities, there has to be more honest conversations about the harm that's happened in the past, right? In terms of, um, Pinel said, you know, that now um, we're starting to, you know, to, to embrace our uh, queer family, right? And, but you, you can't just say, not, we're embracing you now and not say, we're sorry for what happened. We're still, you know, we're, that, that, that has to that has to be repair. Because that's, that's what love is too. It's responsibility. It's, it's it's ownership. It's it's being um, building trust. 
right? Um, there's tensions right now in, in California around affirmative action and our Asian and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters and other folks. So there's, you know, so that kind of conversation about that. And also the sentiment among many black folks like, we do, you know, we go into the fire front lines and then everybody comes behind and like, okay, we have this thing now. And, you know, and then, and, and not really acknowledging, you know, who's being murdered by the police, who's, you know, what, so mm-hmm. all that stuff. So we, I think that's what we need to do is have some more, have some, to come together as, as families. Cause I, I, I believe it full tent, but also we can't just move forward as if um, we, we have had those conversations. We have it. I want to. I, I want to I I say um, just a technical matter. Um, uh, beginning around 105, we are going to be uh, answering questions from you all in the chat. So you can. There's a Q and A um, feature in the chat. So you know, by all means, submit, submit, submit. Uh, based on what um, you know, Lisa Esteban, what you both just said. So I want to talk about the 40 acres. You know, I want to talk about the 48. 40 acres and having that those those civil and difficult dialogues here but also one of one of you know one of the one of the things that me and Dr. Reddick are doing we're we're going to we have this uh, course we're co-teaching on on anti-racism and sort of the reckoning that happened in the United Kingdom and the United States and we're we're taking some students um uh to London with us in June as well um and that was part of the president's award for global learning uh, one of the things we said in that proposal and what we're doing in this course is that universities, higher education, just globally, they, re- they can reproduce systems of power and privilege, um, or they can reproduce systems that try to produce justice and equity uh, uh, and inclusion. Um, and like you were saying, Lisa, repair, right? So I want you to talk about, you know, wh- uh, what is the role of the University of Texas at Austin and the 40 acres in this? What is the role? We know there's a division for diversity and community engagement. You're a special advisor on mentoring faculty. You're doing Black Austin Matters. Uh, but we're all here because we've been privileged, uniquely privileged uh, to, and it doesn't mean we haven't worked hard, but we're still privileged to be at such a, a flagship university, such a wonderful university in so many ways with so many resources that allows us to leverage our aspirations professionally, but also amplify what we're doing vocationally, what we're called to do vocationally, right? Um, but UT has a, a long history, like you were saying, there's a history of racial segregation here. Uh, there's a history of, um, that continues in 2022. We don't have enough Latinx faculty and staff and students. We don't have enough black uh, staff and students. We don't have enough other you know, communities of color. Indigenous. Indigenous. Uh, uh, staff, students, faculty. Um, what what are you trying to do to? And there's many forces at play that try to leverage the University of Texas brand and power for multiple different goals. Um, w- what is the role of UT here? What can we do? Those of us who are faculty, staff, students, alumni, part of networks here. Uh, in Austin, state of Texas, globally, um, in terms of building that beloved community while being honest about the history of the precursors, the history of how we, you know, continue to treat our black and brown um, um, folks here, our Asian American Pacific Islander communities, our indigenous communities, our queer communities here. Uh, So that's a great question. I mean, one thing everyone should do is, is now it's online, the racial geography tour of UT done by yes. uh, Edmund Ed Gordon, yeah. Ed Gordon, Edmund mm-hmm. Gordon, and, and get a sense of, I didn't know, I was so excited about coming here. I didn't really know that that uh, history. And when I arrived, I was, um, you know, slowly started to unpack that. So that's, that's a big part is that we know, first know our history, which I'm also struck by back to the issue of love is the love the precursors still have for this institution, despite what they went through. And I love being able to interview um, Dr. Dr. Delco for Black Austin Matters and hear his story. And I remember when I was sitting in his, in his living room and he was talking about having to live somewhere else besides on campus, you know, as a the first PhD in physiology at UT really struck me. So one of the things we can, I think we can, I'm part of my desire also is to think about, because a lot of, to be honest, a lot of our, our our colleagues nationwide make fun of us and kind of tease, you know, oh, you're, oh my God, you know, and even when people have, have uh, tweeted about jobs available, people 
have said, oh, I would never send my students to, you know, to, to work there. And I want to underscore that you know, it's a, this is a vastly racially complex state and a lot of black folks. So trying to get those who are in the mood right now to do right by these groups, um, those of us who are in positions of leadership are really poised to kind of make some uh, significant changes, I think, at the university um, in ways that students feel welcome and safe to, to navigate the, the university, but also that we invite more people into the tent that look like us. Great, thank you. Um, Esteban, and then we'll yes. go to Q&A. You know, I, I love this, you know, you, Lisa, Lisa, Dr. Thompson, you, you brought up the idea of repair earlier, and I love the idea of kind of like marrying the idea of repair, but also with the idea of belonging. Um, and I and I also want to also kind of tie that in with this idea of storytelling because I think that um, kind of in the idea of Jedi of justice equity diversity and inclusion as we as we bring this this role into the university I think this is one of our biggest superpowers as we try to bring um, uh, more uh, diverse students to campus right as we try to amplify. Um, uh, um, uh, this community um, within with, within a community, right? Um, and 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 I think um, I think it's as we try to transform the University of Texas at Austin into um, uh, where we want to go. Right? I think storytelling will be our biggest uh, superpower. Right? It's telling the story of. Um, what the past has been, right? It's telling the story of who's here making the change. It's it's telling the story of um, who those current students are and, and what they're doing to make it a more equitable place. And I think um, that will really help us kind of garner um, uh, those next transformational students uh, that will be the future uh, of the University of Texas at, at Austin uh, and and the LBJ School. I, I also think that, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Camille. No, I was gonna say, hold that thought, Esteban, because we have a question for all three of us about how do we humanize, I wanted you to continue, but how do we humanize, operationalize Jedi and or strength to love premise in our institutions? I want you to tackle that while, you know, amplifying what you just said, then I'll go to um, uh, Lisa and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to. Definitely. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that in, in this kind of broad sense, you know, I, I really I love the idea of utilizing stories because I think it, it, it really helps us um, with, with tackle some of these really big issues. Um, you know, at the same time, um, you know, we, um, we also, I think, have a, have a duty to listen. Um, you know, um, I think one of, that's one of the biggest things that I, I love about coming into this role and, and being so brand new is I, I get to listen to, um, you know, students who have been here that have been, you know, living um, the life on this on this uh, wonderful campus, and that can tell me, you know, uh, you know what they have been going through, um, where they think the current gaps are, and where they think we need to go. And I think a culmination of, of all of this information will just really kind of um, lead us to being able to kind of co-build, right? What what the um, what the transformation will really look like in the in the coming years ahead. So that's that's what makes me really excited about kind of how we are able to op operationalize all of this in the in the for the future. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. How, what do you think? How do we how do we institutionalize operationalize this? You know, at the university. I think that what's going to lead for me is probably um, a sense of, of respect, like and using certain, I guess, categories of people to test policies. For instance, I mean, just from from the minor thing, like when do we have a department meeting, right? You know, how does that affect someone who is in, in the um, in our in our department that is the most vulnerable? They're a junior person with young kids. You know, do we have it at the times that, you know, the, 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 or, and also when we do programming, that's like a minor thing, but really in my career was a major part of having to navigate that uh, for, for also thinking about uh, how we're looking at conversations around um, hiring that 
um, don't bog down to the usual, I wanted to pick the best person as, a, as if that's always happened. You know, first of all, that, that's the premise where I'm having a problem with, first of all, they, so you're telling me this, we've always picked the best person? If you excluded all these people by gender and race and class, then how are we picking the best person? Um, maybe we should need to define how you see person as a word. So I think really having um, more clear guidelines for those involved in hiring, I mean, uh, where you can't, that argument would be seen as for what it is, which is um, a problematic idea. The, the assumption that, um, the someone who's of color is not the best person for the job, um, you know, or someone who's queer is not the best person for the job is really disturbing. Um, to, to, to make that assumption, uh, if we're taking that into consideration. Um, so that's what I'd like to see. And i also like to see us, um, I just want to talk about this idea of um, creativity, and, um, and, and I do want to see us really put forward more in, uh, across the university um, using and utilizing and foregrounding um, how the important the arts are, because that's the way to get people from quote unquote the, the other side, or basically to, to first communicate ideas with each other in ways that um, I love it because people are disarmed when they're going to listen to music, dance, theater, and are able to take things in. This is why I use laughter in my work too, because you know I, I, I love the fact that when people laugh, really, really laugh, they lean forward and then they take in the message. So I, I like to see more of us integrating the arts throughout the universe, not just in fine arts um, division, but across the university for some of this, but also changing some of the, those conversations. People realize you can't just make those presumptions about uh, the candidates that are up for jobs or students that we're looking at. And um, yeah, there's so there's so many. It's it's a list, it's overwhelming to think about how much we have to uh, do, but one piece at a time, really. Yeah, and to really amplify what, what Lisa and Esteban are saying, I think the way in which we can do it, both at LBJ and the university, it's through, we, we've talked about the four C's, um, the composition of the school, uh, the curriculum that we teach both uh, to our students, but also the public engagement in fora like this, um, the culture that we build, and then finally community. And I think that research uh, policy, but also I think that justice and values and love uh, and dignity should be a part of that. And so I think um, if we do that, one, the university is gonna look very different, but we also have to, in a granular way, connect those notions of composition, culture, curriculum, and community to the various supply chains that the University of Texas is connected to. So we are connected to hundreds and thousands of people, millions of people through vendors, through boards that are for-profit and non-profit, through athletics, through the arts, uh, you know, the Blanton Museum, you know, the Blanton has been doing a, 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 a positive job of diversifying its, its programming. Um, uh, you know, other parts of campus um, have done positive jobs, others less so, right? So part of that has to do with who are we hiring, even to the point when we, we think about this university, who do we hire as consultants? Do we hire, uh, people who are, you know, consulting firm headed by a black woman, an indigenous woman, <laughs> queer people, or is it is it is it uh, more or less the status quo? So we we have huge economic power here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we are connected to Silicon Hills here and venture capitalists and entrepreneurs who are going to be doing, I mean, already doing big things. But we have to center Jedi. Uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion there. And then we have to be transparent, you know, um, Lisa and Esteban about the numbers. We have to be transparent. How many black and brown and other folks do we have uh, in the College of Liberal Arts at the LBJ school, uh, in engineering, at the Dell Medical School? Um, and I, have we created a culture where they feel, where students, faculty, staff feel heard and listened to and respected? And then if we do that, what is our engagement with the community? Black Austin Matters is going out into the community and talking to people. What is our engagement? Do people feel comfortable to come to campus, um, to audit our classes, to sit in at this you know, flagship university, right? Public university, or do they feel that it's a no-go zone because of these rough histories that we've had? So I think that it's a work in progress, um, but I think there's gonna be clear sort of uh, data that we'll be able to see in five years have we been able to do more? Have we been able to allow more students, more faculty, staff, community 
to be a part of uh, the, the privilege that we have uh, in ways that lead to justice for all people, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, it, you know, uh, Dr. Thompson, you're right about, you know, love is also about repair and healing. And I always call it uh, truth, justice, and reconciliation. We've got to tell the truth, right? Then the repair is the justice part, right? Just policies, that's the repair, right? Yeah. And then we get to the reconciliation, which is the part everybody wants. Everybody wants the, you know, you know, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, you know, and she's voting Cicely Tyson and you're, you're clapping your hand, you know what I mean? Everybody wants, you know, um, but we can't, we can't get to that, right? Until you get to the truth and the justice part, it's it's really in incredible. All right, we'll have. A well, few I think more. that this is. I think that this is what's really exciting, though, about the work at, at the LBJ School, because, I mean, all higher, uh, you know, uh, diversity and, and and equity in higher education, uh, you know, in general, is, is an issue, right? It's a it's an issue at the undergraduate level, but it's an even bigger issue when you get to the, you know, um, uh, graduate level, and then uh, when we think about. Um, you know the power dynamic and and policy making. It's an even it's an even bigger issue. Those you know when we think about who's leading us, you know, in the country and moving forward. You know, and and the the black and brown faces or or the the, the queer or, or or trans you know faces. It's 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 an even it's, it's an even bigger issue. And so I think about you know our role and thinking about how do we help those that might be in. Um, you know, coming from a marginalized community or capacity in the world to be able to see themselves, right, at the LBJ school, to be able to kind of think about, um, you know, I want to, I want to uh, step into my power, to be able to step into an opportunity, to be able to have my voice or my community's voice finally be heard, to finally be seen, right, or represented in a way you know, that have that hasn't been historically represented. Um, and to be able to, um, you know, collaborate with leaders like Dr. Joseph and, and Dr. Thompson and, and amazing leaders at, at the LBJ school and cross campus, I think we have an amazing opportunity at the LBJ school to outshine, um, you know, other institutions nationally, because the LBJ school has you know, is 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 um, putting so many amazing resources into um, how we can truly operationalize operationalize this, and we are doing some cutting edge things here in terms of thinking about how can we really help students see themselves be reflected in this school, have their story seen at this school, so they say yes, LBJ is where I want to be. Um, and uh, and also thinking about you know the amazing programming that that uh, our office is going to be you know unrolling out over the the course of the next semester and also over the next year and so that that's what makes me I think really so excited to to be back home at the LPK school. Oh, that's great, thank you, Estevan. We have a question here about where do Jewish students fit into this beloved community and sort of battling anti-Semitism. Um, you know, very quickly, I'd say, you know, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a big central part of it. I think that one of the things we're going to be doing as part of JEDI and CSRD is um, looking at uh, the growth of online hate speech and how do we combine, combat that. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that part of the, the rise of anti-Black uh, racism and the white supremacy we saw in Charlottesville and we saw on January 6th, is absolutely inextricably linked to anti-Semitism uh, and anti-Jewish sentiment. So I think that there's a complex history between Blacks and Jews, um, some of which is very, very positive during the civil rights period. Then as we get to the post-civil rights period, um, um, connected to politics in Israel and the Middle East, stuff that's not so positive. So one, we have to be uh, uh, you know, transparent about that and where are the tensions and where are the cracks. But I do believe there's been uh, an effort at reunification uh, along broad themes of human rights um, uh, with Black and Jewish students. But we have to be able to talk about um, folks who, who disagree with what's going on in Israel and folks who are saying uh, they, they're interested in Palestine and Palestinian liberation. At the same time, they're not interested in anti-Semitism, right? So it's like those things aren't, aren't you know, oh, so it's a, it's a strong conversation. I think that anti-Semitism is one of the scourges that always comes with the rise of white supremacy. So 
Um, at our best, Black and Jewish activists or civil rights and human rights activists have been arm in arm in that struggle. And I think that we have new opportunities here at the LBJ School here in Texas to um, continue that solidarity. Um, this is for, you know, I'm gonna, um, Lisa, we have a question about Dr. King's um, anti-capitalist legacy. What, what do you, what do you, uh, what do you think? I, I, I listen again, listening to him yesterday, I was really struck by his conversation, really do, detailing how class has operated in this country. It was a speech, of course, he made before he was able to do the Poor People's uh, March on Washington, and um, really struck me like what would have happened if that, if he had been able to be there and. Um, I think he was very clear about the way in which class um, both, um, I guess, it offers people a sense of, you know, I guess it's Cheryl House's essay about the um, law, uh, essay about ways of whiteness, whiteness being this thing that people can feel that if I have this and then it doesn't, my class, the challenges aren't as important because at least I'm not those people. Um, but he was very aware of the way in which um, class and race intersect and the ways in which they are used against each other. And I think one thing that I think we don't talk enough about is the way in which uh, the, uh, the assumption that black middle class people are able to kind of escape a lot of things and it really looking at our, our, our health and um, our uh, mortality rates among the black middle class does not play itself out that way. So I wanna make sure we underscore um, some of that, especially, you know, the, the losses that we've had recently of people who are, you know, well placed, but at the same time, um, facing different kinds of challenges. We live, we live better and shorter lives, <laughs> Lisa. <laughs> yeah. and shorter lives. So, and what, I'll, I'll, before we um, break, this is for both of you, but I'll start with um, Esteban. A question about um, sovereignty and indigeneity and sort of reform versus uh, revolution. Uh, really, uh, I'm going to combine those questions. You know, Dr. King uh, definitely talked about revolution of values. Um, do you think we can get that within the context of political reform? And and um, also, uh, we had a question about indigeneity and you know how can we respect indigeneity in the context of being at University of Texas uh, when on some levels the whole U.S. nation state is being questioned in terms of its sovereignty? I'm thinking about Greg Grandin's The End of the Myth and other uh, scholarship on this. So. I want you to, you know, and this will be the last and then and then Dr. Thompson and then we'll close. Definitely. I know this is a big question here. And I think this is a question I think that we, as, I mean, this is a question that I'm definitely grappling with. And I think that a, a number of us are still grappling with. I would say it's a, it's an opportunity for us to learn more, right? Like um, we have a number of amazing voices in this space that we, Right, need to give the microphone to because I think we, in all essence, right, need to need to learn and need to um, defer to them as we kind of try to figure out, you know, what what should we be learning? What should the policy solutions be? I mean, we have a, an amazing new secretary of the of the interior, right, who I think has been uplifted to this amazing new um, uh, position for the first time. Um, and I think is an amazing spokesperson. I think that there are, you know, a number of different leaders. And so I think it's an, it's an opportunity for us to, for deferment, just as, you know, in, as we were saying uh, earlier, repair and, um, and learning, uh, you know, from our, from our black leaders and uh, from certain conversations, I think when it, when it, when it comes to, you know, the first Americans and how we should be um, ensuring that we are, you know, going down the right road and making the right policies and making the right decisions. I think it's the, in terms of that type of repair, it's the, it's the exact same model of leadership that we should be um, uh, pursuing. It's, you know, pass the mic. Uh, and so I, I will, I will leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, listening. I mean, I remember protesting as an undergraduate at UCLA because there were more um, skeletal remains of our indigenous um, brothers and sisters at the university, then there were students. And that was just a hor horrific thing to kind of think about. Um, I think that we uh, also want to think about indigeneity beyond the, the, U the US context, but, but across the globally, um, which includes indigenous Africans and those and in dealing with things. And 
um, in the Southern Hemisphere, New Zealand and, and, and Australia, and that it really, I really feel like I, there's so much more for me to learn um, and also to um, consider. And I just, you know, I, and I wonder again, you know, indigeneity and capitalism, can those two things uh, be thinking about, you know, the way in which indigenous folks cared for the world and care for each other um, in the way we are forced to not care for each other in the world because of the way capitalism um, operates, something we have to kind of grapple with. And um, maybe they'll show up in one of my future plays, we'll see. <laughs> well, thank you so much to both of you. Um, this has been really thrilling. Um, and we've had this conversation on uh, strength to love in a time of crisis. Uh, that is connected to our Strengthening Democracy series. So I want to thank Dr. Lisa B. Thompson, uh, who we've all been listening to and getting the pearls of wisdom, uh, who's not only award-winning playwright and scholar, she's the Bobby and Sherry Pat Patton Professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and College of Liberal Arts Advisor to the Dean for Faculty Mentoring and Support. Um, she's also the author of Beyond the Black Lady, Sexuality in the New African-American Middle Class, Single Black Female, and my personal favorite, <laughs> Underground Monroe and the Monologues, three plays, which are really great that everyone should check out. And she is the co-host of Black Austin Matters. Check it out, check it out, check it out. A podcast on KUT that is launched um, this month with Dr. Richard Reddick, who's also a great friend. Um, and it's it's a brilliant podcast. So, you know, everyone should check it out. And, and thank you so much to uh, uh, Director Estevan Delgado, who's the inaugural uh, Director of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Jedi at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, uh, who sits on numerous boards. Um, he's also part of the Association of Rice Alumni Board um, um, and also uh, serves as Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Social Justice Committee co-chair for the global organization. So uh, thank you to you both. Um, and you know, I'll close by thanking um, our team at, at Jedi and CSRD. Uh, thanks to our LBJ uh, school Dean, uh, Dean J.R. DeShazo um, for his vision and his leadership uh, on these issues of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, thanks to Shante Thompson, uh, who, who's been stalwart in getting our um, progr programmatic uh, uh, initiatives um, done. Uh, thanks to Emily Dunkley, who's, you know, always here, even when she's not here, <laughs> when she doesn't have to be here, uh, who's our senior program administrator. Um, uh, thanks to Alyssa Valdez. Thanks to everyone. Chelsea Chang, who, who came here. Um, and I said, uh, excuse me, Alyssa Vidalez. <laughs> uh, thanks to Chelsea Chang, who's, who's a brilliant uh, LBJ student who gave our introductions. And really, um, Shannon Chapman, uh, who's, who's in OSA and, and who's the new assistant dean. Um, uh, thank you, you know, everyone. And I'll, I'll close by saying what's so, um, what's so important about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and this idea of strength to love in a time of crisis is that King believed uh, in this idea of a beloved community. And it was a beloved community that was free of racial uh, and economic oppression and marginalization, but was also free of violence. Uh, King believed uh, that American democracy uh, was, was the greatest form of, of government, but only if that, that nation, our nation, was compassionate with one another and with other nations. Uh, so when we think about who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is, he's somebody who calls us to an aspirational kind of nation state, an aspirational kind of community, an aspirational kind of vision for who we are. And rooted uh, in that vision is love, love of both individuals and family. But King argued that we could show love in public if we centered it on justice. So King talked about the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. He's quoting the abolitionist Theodore Parker. It's important for us to understand that when we think about love, justice, and public policy, those things aren't mutually exclusive. Those things are actually convergent. So when we have public policies that, you know, we think about child care and health care and people who are poor, we have public policies that show mercy to people who've done wrong things instead of punishment. We have public policy that invest in clean water and better air. Uh, when we have public policies that are interested in racial integration and economic equity, King argued that those were uh, the best facets of American democracy and also provided us um, 
uh, a context where we were part of this world house. We were part of a bigger community that was intertwined, right? Uh, so I think that for all of us who are connected to LBJ, connected to UT Austin, uh, Dr. King's legacy isn't something we should be celebrating only on the third Monday in January uh, annually, but it's something that we should be striving for. We're not going to um, necessarily ever achieve it, but I think the long striving for uh, that beloved community uh, is, is important. And I think we can achieve that beloved community uh, in our lifetime or a better version of the community that we have now if we think about these issues of justice uh, and, and policy uh, and love as being intertwined. And we're able to talk to people who disagree with us. We're able to talk to each other uh, and still understand that we have human compassion and love uh, towards, towards one another. So thank you, everyone. Um, this is part of our Strengthening Democracy series. It's going to continue. We're going to have a great lineup of speakers and conversations in February and March and April uh, and, and in the coming academic year. So thank you uh, all. And let's continue to um, think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that revolution of values, and let's strive to build the beloved community together. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.